Welcome to the start of Series 38, everyone. This month, we have a whopper of a series for you, so we will try to keep these announcements short so we can get to our episode with Jeff Barber, designer of the game we're going to be covering today, Blue Planet Recontact. Which, speaking of, if you like what you are hearing this episode, head on over to the show notes and check out the link to the Kickstarter that is starting on April 6th. The day after this episode releases, we really enjoyed creating characters for the system and the story possibilities are just remarkable. I also got to play a one shot of the game back at Gen Con in 2019 and it really is such a joy. Plus, Rich Howard's name is in the book, so you know it's good. In other news, I wanted to let you know that all of April is Reviews for Good Month at Podchaser. Basically, if you leave a review for a podcast or for individual podcast episodes, Podchaser is going to donate 25 cents for every such review to Meals on Wheels, helping feed those in need. And if we podcasters respond to re a review, Podchaser is going to double that amount. All it takes is a bit of your time and signing up for a free account on Podchaser if you haven't already, and you can leave a review from any internet-capable device, unlike a certain fruit-based podcast store. Not only will this help us out a lot, but the money donated will help out a lot of folks. So let's see what sort of good we can do with reviews. Uh, check out the show notes for more information. And I'll mention this again in the call to action since this is a quite a long episode. But I really hope you can help out with this. Also, we'll read your podcast review on the show too, once I can finally record this with Amelia again. So that is another perk. There is likely more to announce here, but I can't think of anything else right now, and this is getting quite long anyway, so how about we get on with the show? Enjoy. to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and this episode, my co-host Ryan and I are excited to welcome back Jeff Barber, designer of the game we are covering today, Blue Planet Recontact, a futuristic role-playing game that takes place on an alien water world, which may sound familiar to those of you who listen to Series 6 of this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, welcome to Character Creation Cast, uh, Jeff. We're really excited to have you back here with us. Well, thank you for having me very much. I'm uh, excited to be here, and I really appreciate the support for Blue Planet. Um, yeah. I feel a little bit surprised and a little bit special for being on a second time. Yeah, um, no, not many have had that honor yet. Well, I'm, Yeah, it was certainly Rich still has it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's been quite a bit uh, since we've last had you on uh, to talk about Blue Planet. So uh, let's go ahead and start by reintroducing uh, you to our audience. Uh, Jeff, if you want to tell us a bit more about yourself, uh, where we can find you online and any projects you're currently involved in. Sure. Uh, my name is Jeff Barber, and I'm a, a teacher by vocation. Uh, I work at a, a, a boarding school in Tacoma, Washington. Um, Though I have long been a science teacher, I mostly administrate these days running the, the boarding program here. Uh, I design games on the side. Uh, I think most people that are game designers have it as a side hustle. Um, mm -hmm. I, I got into it a long time ago and then was out of it for a very long time uh, and then came back in. Uh, we did Blue Planet, the original edition, uh, at, back in the 90s, which yeah. tells you how old it is. <laughs> um and then I wrote a, a RPG setting for Fantasy Flight called Midnight. Um, if folks are familiar with that. It's kind of like, what if Sauron won? And now it's 100 years later. Um, oh, fun. So it's kind of a, 
a a, a darker fantasy, um, but that was for the the big D twenty glut uh, back in the two thousands. Yeah. Um, and then more recently, actually, I, I, like I said, I've been out of it for a long time. I hadn't done any work on on role playing games for about oh fifteen years or something, and then uh, got inspired by something I just couldn't get out of my teeth and wrote a game called Upwind. Uh, we did a Kickstarter mm. for that, and um, that's that was fun and, and interesting, and about as as far along the spectrum away from Blue Planet as you can imagine. Kind of a, <laughs> yeah, I think we talked about yeah, that last time a, too. A, that you were a, like, a love, "This is everything. This game is not." Yeah, it's a very narrative <laughs> system uh, using playing cards, and it it's it's like a love letter to Studio Ghibli. So it's it's quite different than a hard science fiction mm-hmm. uh, setting. But uh, you can find me at Biohazard Jeff on Twitter, and um, you can kind of keep up with what's going on with Biohazard at biohazardgames.us. That's uh, our website. And then um, soon, and I, and I don't know how this works with podcast time because I know it's variable, <laughs> but soon you could also reach us through Kickstarter um, as we launch the Blue Planet Recontact uh, campaign uh, April 6th. Absolutely. And if uh, my calculations are correct, that should be th- April 5th is the day that this comes yes. out. Oh, nice. so that'll, be, that'll be coming out tomorrow. Timing. <laughs> uh, if you guys have control over your schedule. That's yeah, a little bit. Yes. Yeah, nothing like waiting until the last minute when it comes out like in two weeks. It's fine. <laughs> It's fresh that way, right? It it's is like, fresh. It's right. like produce. Right. Yeah. That's only the freshest podcast content right, here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go ahead and get into this and discuss what this game is all about. What's in a game? Obviously, we had you on uh, before mm-hmm. to talk about Blue Planet. Mm-hmm. Um, so in this game, what kind of world are we playing in? Is it the same? Is it different? How is it different? Yeah, uh, in terms of the setting... Uh, in broad strokes, it's it's not going to be different at all. Um, the thing that I think Blue Planet has, in, the reason it has endured as it seems to have, is because of its setting. Hmm. It's 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 deep, it's rich, it's it's detailed, uh, complex. That's always seemed to be where we we got our accolades uh, primarily. Um, and so, not wanting to mess with success, right? That's we're not really changing that much. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, the, the setting also, um, was kind of poised in terms of the ge- social political events that were occurring to provide what I, I kind of saw as the most ad- adventure opportunity. There was a lot going on and there were a lot of tensions. And so we didn't want to advance the timeline much either because, you know, that's what a lot of games will do when they do a new edition is they advance their timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, we wanted to keep that tension in place. So the timeline's not really advancing either Mm. Uh, we are of course um going through and updating things we're having sensitivity readers which weren't a thing in the 90s yeah Um, Mm -hmm. we are working hard in that regard we're updating a lot of the tech i mean in the 90s there weren't cell phones and we kind of missed a couple of beats there Um, so, (laughs) so we're we're uh um obviously updating the tech a lot we're we are adding in new stuff new sort of social structures new um social and political organizations. Uh, the big thing that is being updated is the uh, mechanics. Those are being, um, I hesitate to say entirely replaced because they are a clear evolution of the second edition of the game, but they are probably the, the difference between them is far greater than w- what you would see in a, in a normal evolution of rules. Mm. They have moved, they've taken advantage of 25 years of game design evolution. Right? Yeah, and what we what we yeah. feel about games and how we play games these days. So that is substantively different, um, and you'll see that in character creation today. Um, I like that you aren't moving the timeline forward because I think, like, I've played a number of games that it was like you really like the first edition or third edition or whatever, and then you go to a new one, and it's like we've made a jump in the timeline, and it's like, well, I like the mechanics better here, but like the story over here was where I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, like kind of reconciling those two things because now suddenly all of the NPCs that you're given are like not statted correctly and you have to do all <laughs> right. of this work to change things. Right. Like obviously any RPG is like, you know, do what you want. Um, but it is always like, I really like this game. I really like this story. I like this world we're playing in. Cool new mechanics. 
totally different world. Right. <laughs> like, yep. that's not what I wanted. Right. Exactly. And that's where we're at. That's our, that's kind of our, our position. Um, yeah, for sure. We are, okay. I'm mean, really excited. We're getting to do, you know, in the nineties, full color books were not even heard of. Right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I remember when the first one came out, I think it was underground and I'm not even sure that it was all full color, but it was kind of industry changing. And I'm so excited to see Blue Planet in full color with all. Oh, yeah. That's going to oh, be gorgeous. That's so cool. I didn't even think about that. That like, yeah, the, uh, the old one wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, uh, not on our outline, but like, what is the thing that going back through you were most like surprised at the change that needed to happen or like thought was like the most interesting change? Like you mentioned the technology and like cell phones mm -hmm. and stuff. Like, were mm -hmm. there things in there that you were like, Oh boy, I got that one wrong. Or like yeah, you were like, oh, I was actually really right. Or <laughs> there were some things that were were kind of right, but I mean, anybody writing science fiction can see trends and kind of predict. Um, what surprised mm -hmm. me the most, or not surprised, what what feels the most clunky when you look at it now, is that we had a different device for everything, right? You had a navigation device and you had a communication device because mm -hmm. you know, that's oh, how the yeah. world worked back then. <laughs> um and and we also had like different size batteries and like uh the idea that not the, we just sort of we understood what rechargeable batteries were and we had really fancy energy sources but this idea that you would have devices that you could remove the batteries from was still that was still a thing so those are super clunky now when you look back at it but um you know that's easy to fix mm -hmm. that's really fun like i remember recently very recently explaining to my children that like you used to only be able to text on your phone i was like i remember like somebody in my class in college had an iphone and it was like oh, how can you afford that that's like the coolest you can do the internet on your phone right. and like my kids are like okay whatever mom <laughs> and i was like you could play snake he's <laughs> like you could play snake and now they're like you know they've got their switch and their ds and their you know um but it's like we've come so far in 10 years mm -hmm. <laughs> like you know much less you know 20 or whatever um yeah that's i didn't even think about that that like there's it, it's all one thing now yeah <laughs> is my phone and my map and my you know and, I, and you know and even even this idea of the cloud right and that yeah. really oh, yeah. affects technology because of access and storage and who controls the gate and all that kind of thing mm. um and that's an idea that even if we had done this 10 years ago probably would you know I, i'm yeah. not a tech guy so i, I would have probably missed that that adds a, a whole nother dimension uh to a lot of the stories that you can tell in blue planet i can imagine I was, I was playing Shadowrun at one point too, and you have like the Matrix, and I was like, "Oh, it's like the internet." And like, I remember my my table being like, "Yeah, but like worse." <laughs> and I was like, "Why is that so cool?" <laughs> like, because it was written forever. Ago. Yeah, that's very fun. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, what sort of tools then do we need to actually play this game? Uh, nothing special as far as as uh, traditional role playing games go. I mean, a book couple of character sheets uh something to write with and and d10 uh, they, i was gonna say is it still a d10 yeah, the game system still, i remember that still uses uh, a small pool of d10 so you need three d10 oh, oh that's nice nothing special about them very that's cool super easy. yeah i'm gonna have to figure out my d10 dice if i need to roll them for character creation um so what kind of stories and themes does this game explore and you know are they roughly the same as what you worked with in blue planet or have you changed those things i know we said that the setting is kind of the yeah, same the, well that, that's a, a big question for a couple of reasons um one is if, if we've received there's been two sort of I, I won't call them consistent criticisms but if they've been criticisms there are two that have been consistent mm. um, and one of them is uh, it depends, I, I think, probably on your politics, but it was identified as sort of a, a left-leaning environmental game, right? Mm -hmm. It was about this water world, and it assumed that there was ecological collapse because of this agricultural blight on Earth, and uh, all the all the bad things that were portents, you know, vague portents to scientists back in the '90s, were part of of this ecological decline that was driving this setting. 
Mm-hmm. And then on the planet of Poseidon, there was this fresh new opportunity for humans to be more respectful of the ecology and the native population recognized that. And then the newcomers with their big mining conglomerates um, didn't. And so there was that, that was the big sort of one of the big in game tensions. Right. And so a lot of people. And that would never happen no. in real life. That's, <laughs> and, I mean, what kind of leftist fantasy are you living <laughs> And a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot of people, if someone had trouble with the politics, it was around that, right? Um, and, I, and I understand that. I, I get it. But um, it's, it's what I knew as a, as a science teacher. It's, it's what I, I liked and what I could write about. And it meant a lot to me. So it, it was, you know, that, what's that advice you get from your English teacher when you're, a kid like write what you know. So mm-hmm. I had written mm-hmm. what I knew. And um and if anything, that that is a stronger thing now. Those the things, you know, back then a lot of people wouldn't have known what global warming was, let alone climate change or ocean acidification or or reef bleaching or anything like that. Um but now a lot of those things are you know daily conversations. So if anything, the the opportunity to um lean into that is is greater now and the need to lean into that is greater now Mm -hmm. um so that that's something that i think might have been considered a a detriment in the past uh from some people's perspective about the game but now it's something that we're we're definitely leaning on um leaning into uh as as to add our small little tiny voice to the chorus that's calling for better stewardship of the planet right absolutely Mm -hmm. And then sort of the other um, criticism that the game got, and this was more more uh, game related, was that the setting was so big and so uh, broad that a new game master would come in and they just wouldn't know where to start, mm. right? Um, and and I guess in, in a way that was sort of intentional because we wanted to present a, a realistic and vibrant world that was full and people could play in that world any way they wanted to. Mm. Um, but I, I think people were so used to games presenting you a default campaign. Um, you are an explorer of dungeons or you are, um, a shadow runner or you are right. Mm -hmm. Um, in this, you could be anything from a orphaned street urchin to, uh, a mega rich corporate executive, anything in between and, and a super soldier to a native freedom fighter, um, and I think a lot of people sort of struggled with that, at least from the reviews that have been out there or just conversations that we've had. Um, and so we are trying to address that in a very specific way with the new edition. But that's sort of the other area that has been, um, I guess, a, a critique. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that's still a concern given like the 20 years or whatever of sort of evolution in game design? Because I feel like there are a lot more like, rules light open world kind of games too i mean obviously there are still people that are used to coming from something with like a you know pretty strict setting or or something like that but like is that something that you think maybe people are more open to now i think people might be more comfortable with it but i think if you look at the games that um have kind of guided game design in the last few last years let's take uh, like blades in the dark for example Mm -hmm. that is extremely I think one of the things that appeals to people is how narrow it is, right? Yeah. You get started in 15 minutes, your character, you're told exactly what your character does. You're given a few options to pick from, and then you go do a very specific task, which is a, a heist, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, right. And, and I think with the busy lives people are leading um, and still wanting to game, there's a lot of appeal in that. Uh, and, For sure. and we're definitely not that, but we needed to, yeah. but we needed to uh, address that. Um, and, and so we've taken some steps to do that for sure. Yeah. Very cool. So then when we get into the game and we actually start playing, what do characters do then, uh, in this game and what sort of Um, options do we have? Well, I guess, uh, as a segue, um, anything goes, right. Um, I think this game really benefits from a, a really thoughtful session zero where you talk with your players and try and figure out what kind of game you know you all agree what kind of game you want to play what kind of game you want to run and then you build your character party around that intention now finding that that decision finding that consensus might be challenging um, but once you have it then you can create your character concepts and it's generally okay to move forward 
but you can do it for anything, right? Do you want to play a, an adventure game where you're exploring? Do you want to play a conflict-ridden game where there's a lot of sort of military tactics? Do you want to play a, an urban survival game? Do you want to play a rural survival game? Do you want to play corporate espionage? Do you want to play in space? Do you want everyone to be living in the asteroid belt and, and try and just get by day to day? Um, the thing that we are doing to address that uh, structurally in the game is that we are providing what we call campaign archetypes. Mm. So uh, you know how there was, it, it seemed to be more of a trend in the past, um, but I, I, there are games that still do it. You get to the middle of the, the book and there's a bunch of sort of pre-made characters to show you the kinds of characters you can play. Mm -hmm. They'll have a character mm -hmm. sheet, it'll be filled in, there'll be an illustration of the character and a little background stuff. And there'll be like eight or ten of those that give you, oh, I can play this kind of person. I can be the hacker and I can be the, the gun runner and I can mm -hmm. be... Um, and then even more so with things like Blades in the Dark, right? You can play the Leech, you can play the... Mm -hmm. um, so we've expanded that to be for campaigns instead. So we're providing these little uh, like 2,000 word, two page spread um, campaign structures that give you the sort of structure for the campaign, the, the hooks for the campaign, the kinds of characters that you would want in it, uh, a little collection of NPCs that will be associated with it, and then some um, little adventure threads that you can build on to make, make to start your campaign and, and maintain mm. your campaign. Um, that's really cool. Like that's, that is very smart. I, my brother is starting his first, um, GMing mm -hmm. experience. He and his friends have played D and D, and then he reached out to me and was like, "Hey, uh, can you tell me about some other games?" And I was like, "You're gonna have to be more specific." <laughs> There's a few. Um, but he's he's been sort of like texting me about all of these ideas. He's like, "I just don't like know where to start." He's like, "I know that they want to play." Um, first it was cyberpunk and then they kind of decided sci-fi and he's like, I don't know what to have them do or like how to, you know, like how to make these things happen and like what's, you know, what are good sort of hooks to do these things. And so like, I think especially for first time GMs, like those will be really, really useful tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are like, so. you're explaining like all of the questions that he's asking me that I'm like, I don't run games. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping so. We're trying to be really specific with them. So, you know, we themed out, like these are the themes that run through Blue Planet. So we tried to pick one for each theme. And it's not like if you want to run an environmental theme, these are the things you do. We're trying to be really specific. Like mm -hmm. the the one that's in the quick start guide is based on the playtest campaign that I've kind of been running off and on for years called Red Sky Charters. And so that was the theme of like uh, the intersection between the native culture and the newcomer culture. Mm -hmm. um, and and so it's a family run business where they are kind of a guide service, but also a, a freight company uh, and they're you know barely making ends meet and they have to take increasingly dubious jobs to do that mm -hmm. so it's kind of like firefly but we were doing it long before firefly was a thing because you know 90s again, <laughs> but, um and that's been um so that was the example that we present in the quick start guide and, and it's mm -hmm. got specific characters and specific events and and so it um it reads like sort of the elevator pitch for a, a television series and that's mm -hmm. kind of what we're trying to do for each of these little little bits yeah, I think I played yeah. the opener to that specific scenario at Gen Con in you 2019. Yep. No, uh, that's the that's the um, Quick Start Guides Adventure is the one that you played. Yeah, it was fantastic. Uh, had a really fun time with that one, um, and still remember qu quite vividly to this day. So you had a good table too. There was a lot of good energy at that. It was fantastic. Yeah, I love games like that where you're like everything just like clicks into place and like you're set to go. Mm -hmm. But I, I really, I'm, I'm very excited for you for that idea. Like that's, I think, going to be super helpful for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Like smart. We're actually putting a, a, the intention is to have a couple extra ones <clears throat> as stretch goals in the Kickstarter and, and Ooh, yeah. we're trying to line up some uh, industry luminaries to, to write them. Mm -hmm. um, very so. nice. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Mm -hmm. What do you think is unique about this game? Like why, if somebody's looking at their game store and like a shelf of books, why grab Blue Planet? Um, I would say depth of setting. Yeah. Um, there's not, well, depth of setting and hard science fiction. There's not a lot of that in RPGs. 
Mm. Um, even things like, I mean, there are other things you can point to that, that are good science or accurate science, but then there's often an extension that makes them not scientific, more science fantasy, I suppose. Yeah. Or not very deep. I feel like the combination of the two, I think. Yeah, I think that especially I think that's what makes us if we're unique, that's what that does it. I mean, I hope the new rules are, are good and I hope people like them, but I I'm not enough of a of a, a mechanics uh designer, a strong enough mechanics designer to feel like, oh, that's what should draw people to the game. Um I mm -hmm. do think it's the setting and I do think it's the at least the, the respect we try to play, pay science as it plays into the... I mean, obviously, we have wormholes, traversable wormholes. So it's still science fiction, but mm -hmm. we're trying to do what what seems possible. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the history of the game uh, before we hop into the character creation stuff. Um, now, Blue Planet, the second edition, came out 25 years ago or so. Yeah. Um, so and... first edition was published in 97. And yeah. I think second edition was 2002, maybe 2001, mm. something like that. What was the difference between those two? So we had produced the first edition as Biohazard Games. And mm -hmm. we, um, at Gen Con one year, we ran into the guys at Fantasy Flight. And they had just released Disc Wars. Are you guys familiar mm. with that? Mm -hmm. um, and that had made them kind of cash flush all of a sudden. And they didn't have role-playing games, and they wanted one. And we were kind of tired of trying to carry Blue Planet on our backs because it was just me and my partner, Greg, yeah. who I need Greg Benage. I need to just give a shout out. Um, I keep talking about me and I. He uh, Blue Planet wouldn't exist without him. Um, mm -hmm. If there's anything good in it, it's because he came on to the project <laughs> and, and made sure that we made it good. <laughs> but they said to us, hey, you guys want to license it to us and we'll do an, a new edition and all the books that you had talked about doing that you're clearly kind of tired and don't want to work on on your own anymore, we'll, we'll do that. And um, they wanted one of us to come work for them and run the line. And I had a teaching job that I didn't want to give up. And, and so Greg took that gig and he worked for them for a long time, put out a bunch of role-playing products through Fantasy mm. Flight. Um, and they never owned the game, but they did have the license for a long time. Um, and then it reverted back to us. and then. Um, it was licensed again by um, a company called Capricious Games. Uh, oh, and then, oh, no, sorry, they were Red Brick Games, and then their name became FASA because they got some other people involved and, and sort of picked up the FASA role-playing lines. And then they changed their name again to Capricious Games. Anyway, so they did this third edition. They did this revised edition. Mm. So if you look <clears throat> on, like, RPGGeek.com, you'll notice sometimes they refer to second edition revised. And this was put out by Red Brick. Um, and uh, it was just some minor tweaks in the mm -hmm. second edition rules. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to get it out and on drive through RPG. And it was just a way to sort of sustain the line because they were big fans. And they um, were doing that with a couple of the games like uh, Earth Dawn. Okay. Kind of fallen out of production and they were keeping that alive. Oh, very cool. And then they kind of folded up and it sat with us for, you know, reverted back to us and sat with us for a bunch of years. Yeah. Awesome. So, so then what sparked the, the thought to bring this back and update the rules and, and all that sort of stuff? Um, well, it was probably working on Upwind. Um, I got, I was working on Upwind. We we're just about to launch the Kickstarter and um, I got involved with uh, Stuart Wick, um, who, People may know from White Wolf Publishing. He was one of the Wick brothers who created White Wolf and the World of Darkness mm -hmm. uh, and Drive Through RPG and, and all of that. Um, and he was kind of getting back into publishing after having you know sold all that off. And then he was bringing together a bunch of different small games into like a studio. And he pulled in Upwind. But really, I think what he wanted to do was pull in um, Blue Planet for future options and the, that midnight line that I talked about. Mm -hmm. he, was, mm -hmm. he had licensed that from Fantasy Flight and we're going to do a new edition of that and do a new edition of Blue Planet. Sadly, through the middle of that, uh, he passed away. Um, uh -huh. And so that plan kind of stalled a little bit. But as part of that, I met um, Alan Barr, who runs Gallant Knight, Gallant Knight Publishing. 
Um, and he was actually part of Stuart's little studio. He was Stuart's basically assistant in that whole project. Um, and so he said, well, why don't we continue with Blue Planet? And um, I was kind of hemming and hawing. Like I had just come off of Upwind and I was retired and didn't want to work on it anymore. Mm-hmm. And then comes along Rich Howard. <laughs> oh, Rich. <laughs> and I've told Always him many encouraging times, people to get into things. Yeah, I've told him many times that I hold him responsible for all the time, blood, blood sweat, and tears that are going into this. Um, but he has, for as long as I can remember, been the biggest Blue Planet fan. In fact, that's how we met, just through his uh, his, his uh, like of Blue Planet. And he, connected with me on the internet. We finally met at Gen Con a few years ago and uh, his enthusiasm for everything is infectious. And, um, you know, it's like a superpower when you're in the room, you think you can do anything when he's there supporting right. you. He's just like endlessly right. encouraging right. and mm-hmm. like um, uh, shout out to Rich who like, I, I swear got me through my divorce with like his messages oh. of like, you can do this. I believe in you. You're great. And I was like, I am that great. You're right. Just like, him. like that's, uh, unfortunately yes. when he's not in the room, I tend to lack the energy that I have when he is. So <laughs> right. As soon as he walks away, you're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> right. Right. Um, so that's, that kind of brought us to the decision-making point. And I think technically we were at Gen Con a couple of years ago and, and we're like, should we do this? I don't know if I should do this. I, I'm, I'm sure there was a little bit of beer involved. Um, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you got it. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then I tell the guy, yeah, we'll do it. And then the next day I'm flying home going, oh God, what have I done? Um, and, and then here we are. And I'll tell you one thing, Rich Howard or not, a pandemic is not a place to find motivation for writing role-playing games. No. So it's been a hard year getting to where we are. But Mm -hmm. here we are, Kickstarter is launching and... You know, it's we're at the top of the roller coaster now. We'll see what happens. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's been a weird thing about this pandemic is that I'm suddenly like, I have all of this time for all of these creative endeavors and it's going to be and none of the energy or willpower or, you know, I'm like, I don't I have an extra two hours a day because I don't have a commute and, you know, like all this kind of stuff. And it's like none of the energy to do any of it Mm -hmm. like (laughs) and then i feel bad about it but apparently everybody's in the same boat it seems so there's at least that Mm -hmm. (laughs) i want to i want to know what is it like working on a new version of this sort of revisiting um the things that you you did before like looking closely at your previous work and then sort of trying to fold in all of the design changes and things that have happened over the last 25 years? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, it depends on what I'm working on and I guess the mood I'm in. Mm-hmm. Working on mechanics, I I don't love working on mechanics. I don't mind mm-hmm. it, but I don't. it's not what I get into. I'm more of a world sure. building kind of guy. Mm-hmm. But when I do do mechanics and something clicks, then I can get really excited. It feels so good, I, doesn't it? Yeah, when you so, have that like a moment. Of, yeah, so oh, I, like, I like that. I like when that happens in mechanics. And obviously that's been sort of the biggest push so far, because we had to write a new system, uh, and then a new character creation system, which is debuting today. Yeah, I mean, we've been playtesting it for a long time, and I've been using it at cons and and in my uh, personal games. But in terms of like publicly sharing it, this is this is it, right? Yeah. Um. So that's that's been that's one kind of like technical focus, and it has moments that are rewarding, but it doesn't have the same kind of emotional response in, in me when I'm working on it. Mm-hmm. The other stuff, the setting, alternates between, oh, my God, I was a genius back in the 90s, <laughs> to like, oh, God, I was super cringy and and could not write to my way out of a wet paper bag back in the 90s. <laughs> um, again, when I talk about things that are good in Blue Planet, Greg is a fantastic writer and um, – when I read, I'm reading through, I go, wow, this is really, oh, you know what? I think Greg wrote this part. Uh, so, <laughs> so there's that. Um, but it's been really rewarding to look back and still feel like, yeah, there, there's still something to be said here. This is still, this still feels different than, than what's come since. And so I'm not, I'm not feeling like we're putting it out in the world simply to, to rehash something old. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if new players can come to Blue Planet and see things that are, and see the things that I that I hope they can that we're putting into it, um, they'll they'll like it all, all over again uh, because it does present something different 
uh, and something that, as I mentioned before, I feel is really timely um, in terms of its sort of underlying messages, if, if a role-playing game can be said to have underlying messages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I that was really interesting to me when you talked about that before, like the feeling of, you know, people being like climate change and all that kind of stuff being like crazy far left. And then like the fact that that's really basic stuff that my kid is learning in school right now is just that like climate change is a thing. Here's what's happening. You know, he's like very concerned about it. Um, I mean, and granted, I'm pretty far left. I will, I will admit <laughs> that. Um, but just like the difference that that amount of time makes in, in something so simple. Mm-hmm. Um, do you find that you're still like, I mean, I guess you must be because you're making another edition of it, but like really sort of like excited and passionate about this thing that you made. Like, does that feel good to like look back at it and be like 25 years later, I'm still like really feeling this, you know? Yeah. um, I guess the answer is maybe sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. (laughs) Some some days it is, some days no. (laughs) Well, and I don't mean that in any kind of like deprecating way or false way. when you write something, and you've probably had the experience, especially if it takes a long time, and then the first Blue Planet took like four years to write, mm. um, and then you write supplements for it, and you play countless hours of the game, and uh, it you live in it in a way that nobody else ever did, right? I mean, I feel mm-hmm. like I can run a Blue Planet game cold without even any any prep because I live in the world, and any question somebody has about it, there's no more accurate authority than than me and i don't mean that to brag it's just that i've lived there so long and i wrote so much of the book that uh, what i say kind of it's my world i can i can say things and mountains grow right like Mm -hmm. right like and technically uh, yeah if i say it it is canon so (laughs) yeah yeah so (laughs) so having lived in it like that there's nothing Mm -hmm. else that uh, i can compare it to that i that i i get that much so it, it's really just um it's not almost separate from from my experience anymore i don't look back at it as, as just a separate thing and say uh this is good or bad or whatever it just is and sometimes i feel like i'm too close to it to mm-hmm. actually see the flaws anymore at least the bigger flaws um i'm always picking at the little ones but to see the sort of bigger scope and i worry about that too right like what am i missing in this second edition that um that i would see if i had fresher eyes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think that's what playtesting is for. That's what having a team is for, and mm. you know. Um, sure. But yeah, I could see that of like, you've looked at it so many times that it sort of starts to like, it's, you know, like you walk past that coffee cup on your counter so many mm-hmm. times that you just like don't see it anymore. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I could see that being uh, a thing when you've, when you've been like deep in it for mm-hmm. so long. Absolutely. Well, I, I really want to dive into character creation, uh, but there are probably some basic terms and concepts that I'm we're going to be like, cover. stop talking about all this other stuff. It's time. I mean, to- <laughs> no, I really love it. Um, <laughs> but we'll be here for six hours if we. <laughs> okay. I'll stop asking questions that are not on the outline. <laughs> it's good questions. Um, so what are some of the basic terms and concepts uh, that we need to know uh, to create characters? I, I put a few in the outline that I kind of had questions about. Um, well, those are good ones to pick. because That kind of covers it all, I think. Sweet. Yeah. So what do you got? Uh, we got concept. Uh, tell me a little bit about the concept. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't think it's unique to Blue Planet for sure. I think everybody has had character concepts before. We just mm-hmm. wanted to kind of codify it a tiny bit as the first step in character creation because i think it's so useful it's the kind of stuff that you ask your players to come to a session zero with right Mm -hmm. um a couple of adjectives and a noun or two um for the kind of character you're imagining you want to play and i think if someone has the concept for their character that they can latch on to it makes all of the other questions they have to answer about that character a lot easier uh, and so it feels like, for me, it feels like a necessary first step if you want to certainly have a, a cogent character write-up mechanic in a book so that it's a good place to start. But I think for a session zero, too, or or just someone sitting at their table making their own character, it's a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, yeah, the idea would be to pick, um, like I suggest, a couple of adjectives, a couple of nouns that describe what what the character 
is in terms of maybe a profession or uh, their major life activity, um, something about the, the way they interface with others um, and um, what their attitude or outlook is to the rest of the world, um, and then just build on that. Okay, very cool. Um, and then I see on the the character sheet, there's the everyday exceptional and elite. I believe that was in the last version as well. It is. Yeah. The, the, where you start with sort of your character build depends on the general scope of the campaign you want to play. Do you want the characters to be sort of everyday people? Um, that would be obviously every day. Uh, do you want them to be, um, exceptional so that they are, uh, you know, maybe wealthier or maybe physically more capable or better trained or, or some combination of the both of both. They want to have more resources in terms of allies and, and patrons and organizations that they can call on. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can find, I mean, I, I would, I am definitely an everyday person. Um, but maybe, uh, the owner of, a of a big company, um, or someone who is in, in the active military, uh, in the, maybe special forces might be considered um, an exceptional character because of the kinds of training they have or the resources and backup they <laughs> have. And then, of course, exceptional would be sort of the fantastic action hero style or, you know, uh, corporate moguls or um, uh, famous uh, Nobel winning prize, prize winning scientists, that kind of thing, um, where their knowledge or training or physical prowess um, are far beyond uh, uh, normal people and just uh, seem like action hero character or action movie characters. Yeah, that's the elite, right? Yep. Very cool. Um, and then I, I see we've got the we've got four attributes, uh, cognition, psyche, coordination and physique. Uh, but there's a bunch of circles there and. Uh, I'm very curious about uh, what we need to know about those. Okay. So in the this, if we make any comparisons between mechanics in this system and the, uh, and the previous system, it's between this and second edition. Uh, first, and, first and second edition rules are completely different. First edition rules I wrote, they're pretty terrible. Uh, Greg wrote most of second edition rules. They're, I really liked them, but they, do, they are dated um, mm-hmm. uh, in, so, in many ways. We had uh, like like eight attributes plus another like six or seven derived attributes in second edition. Mm-hmm. So there was like fourteen attributes, which today in these in, in modern game design just doesn't fly, right? Um, but we did have them grouped into cognition, psyche, coordination, physique, because the those are easily grasped areas of sort of a person's uh, well of, of a persona. And so we kept those as the primary attributes um, to simplify it down to four. Uh, and cognition is pretty self-evident, the kinds of things that they would uh, address in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and they each get a value that you, uh, they all start, human average is zero. So there are ways to change that average because you get some points to add, but you also get biomods and there's also other species you can play or other species of human that you can play. They all affect those numbers. Um, and they either, either up or down, mm. uh, the blanks that under each one, um, are for optional focus attributes. And this mm-hmm. is one of the areas that I, that I like the most about the new mechanics. What I wanted to do, the, the kind of guiding tenant in the new mechanics was increase the simplicity and accessibility, um, but maintain the kind of realism in describing a person that would parallel the realism in which we're describing the setting. I didn't mm-hmm. want to go full narrative mechanics because I didn't want to so simplify the people and maintain this super like science, hard science setting. It felt like that a, makes strange, a lot of sense. It felt like a strange matchup. So yeah. I wanted the characters rather than use complex characters to create that. I wanted to um, use evocative characters to create that. Right? Okay. Because in previous editions, it was all about the complexity. We had over 100 skills to describe all the skills that somebody could have because we wanted to be realistic. Um, modern game design is not that not that focused on realism, mm-hmm. right? And that yeah, I'm looking at the character sheet from the last time that we right. that we talked to, and I'm like, this is so much cleaner. <laughs> so one of the ways to do that is to give um, the players 
the chance to create a lot of their own content to describe exactly the characters they want. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways we do that with attributes is that you can pick focus attributes and you'll see those listed in the, in the um, character creation outline that I sent you guys in the mechanics. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are descriptors that fall within each of those categories, cognition, psyche, coordination, uh, physique, that um, you can either pick from the lists we provide or create your own. Mm. And they just give a little bit of nuance to the character you're playing. They make that character ultimately unique because no one else is ever going to have that combination of traits. So with just a couple of words in a couple of blanks, your character is now unique in the Blue Planet universe. Uh, And mechanically, so let's take cognition, for example, and let me call up my list here real quick, just so that we can talk about what's actually in Mm -hmm. the book. Um, For example, we give a list of possible focus attributes for cognition of things like aware, calculating, clever, cunning, focused, and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Logical, resourceful, witty. Um, You write one of those in or make up your own. And then the score for that focus attribute is just a plus one over whatever your cognition is. So if your cognition is one, then your focus attribute of witty would be two. Hmm. Um, But with that, just that little simple step, you don't add a lot of complexity because it is very intuitive what you're doing. Uh, But you do now have a character that is unlike potentially anybody else's character ever made for the game, Hmm. but also with a very... um, intentional nuance helps describe the character you you're trying to play. And it, and it sounds like if you play to those uh, focus attributes as a, as your character, you have a better chance of success. Correct. That's Absolutely. Awesome. Yep. And it's, it's interesting in play because there's an emergent element where as someone's deciding bet- between say using savvy or logical uh, to go along with their test, uh, it tells the table how they're doing the thing right? mm-hmm. in a way that just rolling cognition wouldn't. That's awesome. I like that a lot. Yeah, um, it's, it's a, tu- it's a, it's a touch that we're finding. Uh, it, I'm finding a lot of um, uh, sort of satisfaction in terms of game design. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, let's see. Uh, and I know in the last version of the game, uh, skills were kind of a big deal. Uh, and here we've got skill sets. Uh, I remember playing with this a bit um, at, at uh, Gen, Gen Con, Con 2019. Yeah. I really like that. Do you want to tell us a bit about the skill sets? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in the previous edition, I think there was 100 and something skills, and we tried to cover kind of all the different um, possibilities for, for a character in, in the setting. Uh, and not only that, but we clustered them into what we called aptitudes, mm-hmm. right? So there was another layer on top of it where yeah. you might be good at scientific things and you might be good at physical things, but maybe you were terrible at, or, or less good at social things, which, you know, is, is how you kind of try to model people, I suppose, uh, characters. But there was a lot of front end work on the, involved in that. Um, and then a lot of math because you had so many points to spend and so forth and so on. I liked the aptitude area because it did provide a nuance to help you create the character you wanted to create. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I didn't want the complexity of that in the actual character creation or in play. I didn't want people to have to like, okay, what's my aptitude in this? Okay, so and then I wrote that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But I wanted to capture that nuance. So with skill sets, we've done that by, uh, we've, we've followed more modern game design in reducing complexity, but increasing sort of, robustness and applicability mm-hmm. by tossing out all the skills entirely and trusting <laughs> trusting people to understand that if i say my character is a biologist anything that would fall under the purview of being a biologist would be something they should be able to do right yeah if i am a biologist in a science fiction setting i probably have some passing familiarity with computers mm-hmm. right so i should be able to do some basic computer stuff without having a computer skill in addition to my biology skill, yep. right? Um, I should be able to identify uh, an animal or at least guess at the characteristics 
uh, of that animal, uh, the behavior of that animal based on its physical characteristics, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't need a skill in taxonomy or a skill in um, like field science or um, or predator behavior Mm -hmm. to be able to say something about that creature. Um, But we also didn't want things to be super skills where I'd pick a skill and just an area of expertise in everything. I am a jack of all trades and I, that is my skill set. So we do, we do have some, some guidelines around it. Um, and I like to use science, the science example because I, I trained as a biologist, but, um, we'll use that as, as a, the basic descriptor for how the skill sets work. So for the skill sets are broken into three categories. You've got, um, general, core, and specialty. So any, any given skill set has those three parts. So I might pick biologist as my, as my general. Um, and then maybe I'll pick um, lab scientist as my um, core. Mm. And then maybe I'll pick geneticist as my specialty, right? So realistically, if you talk to a biologist, they're not just a biologist. Every biologist mm-hmm. now, especially in the future, is, has increasing areas of expertise, mm-hmm. right? Um, if they're an active biologist. So um this models that realism in people's jobs and careers, right? As you get increasingly specialized in something. Um, and mechanically, the payoff is that as you go from core or, or general to core to specialty, you go from 1.d10 to 2d10 to 3d10 when you're making tests for that thing. Mm-hmm. So all the biologist kind of things, I would roll 1d10. Anything to do with a lab like maybe computers or running a test or testing a blood type or whatever, I would roll 2d10. And anything related to genetics, I would roll 3d10. Okay. Mm -hmm. That folds in this idea of aptitudes from the previous uh, version of the game seamlessly into the skill sets while simultaneously giving us really way, way more than just 100 skills. You have all the skills that are possible in the universe. The players just get to choose what they are yeah and Um, i I love those conversations with the gm of i think this would fit under my you know specialty because and then the gm would be like well maybe and and then you get to have that little back and forth before you roll those dice well and then you're exactly right and that's kind of intentional because then you take your aptitude that best matches with the the thing you're actually dealing with at the moment uh, is this logical is this Mm -hmm. uh, witty, is this intuitive, Um, and then you link it to that skill set for any particular role. So you're telling the whole table, uh, I'm a a geneticist, we're looking at this alien creature, I got no idea what it is, I'm going to use intuitive, because I'm just going to try and like guess at it, or I'm using logical, because there's all this evidence in here, right? And Mm -hmm. that gives a subtlety to the the role, it flavors the role in a way that um, I I really like. but it also gives you a chance to make exactly the character you want because you can specify their skill sets um, and you don't have to worry about the details. Like, did I take a computer skill? Oh, I forgot to take driving. How can I be like the kind of guy that I don't have a driving skill? Um, and you're not fighting over, you're not kind of min-maxing over your point assignments mm-hmm. so that you get a, try and make a realistic character. This way, um, you just make a character that feels like a real person. Yeah. With, uh, and by the time you're done assigning your skill sets, you have what what I think is a, an absolutely unique character that no one else is ever going to have in the world of Blue Planet. And that's kind of fun. Um, in most games, there are going to be, like if you play a tiefling warlock and you're trying to m- maximize the character's struck uh, build, there's going to be a lot of other tiefling warlocks that are exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, and do you so think that some of that is due like obviously some of it is like evolution of game design that we don't need like 7,000 skills like looking at you palladium games um <laughs> do you do you think some of that it has to do with like the evolution of the like gm player dynamic too because i feel like in the past because it was always sort of viewed as more like adversarial too that it was Mm. like if you don't have that skill you can't make that role and now i think we live in a world where like as a player i can go to my gm and be like here's why it should work and the gm can say yeah like i can trust that they will listen to that too like i think that's a that's a great insight i think that's absolutely true because 
I think now there's this sense of cooperation and storytelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely my approach to gaming. And that's how I play Blue Planet. I mean, some people might not be. But if everybody at the table is trying to make that lift, it's going to be a lot cooler. And if you give players the chance to make cool characters, they they generally do. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're not fighting over like, is that really covered by computer skills? I don't know. If that's, you don't have computer skills, so you can't like. <laughs> that's a cell phone, not a computer, sir. Yeah, you can't go to a website. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, Sorry, you Sorry this is Google a space Wendy. Because you don't have computers, right? <laughs> uh, so I think I think you're absolutely right. I think that it's definitely a uh, an open artifact of more modern table dynamics in in game design. I mean, it's hard to say like how much of table dynamics is influenced by game design and like how much is the other way around but i do think that like they're you know when i play older games it's it's like well you don't have that specific skill to do that thing and then i play something like i always bring up l5r because that's my game of choice but it has like approaches where you say like i am doing this quickly Mm -hmm. or you know like but like you explain how you're doing it and that influences whether you know, or like how you're role playing it influences mm-hmm. whether you can do that thing or not. And I yeah. think that it's sort of a way that modern game design has. I don't know. Like I said, I don't know which it's a chicken and egg thing, but well, like it, I can see the difference here of like I should be able to justify to my GM rather than my GM saying, you don't have hiding. Right. So right. you can't do that. <laughs> I think it's a natural evolution. And I think it's would somehow be better served. We still say game, right? Role-playing right. game. And I, and I think that is evidence of its history because they started as games where there was like a winner and a loser and mechanics that guided the result. Mm. And it'd be great if we could somehow call them something else, role-playing experiences or role-playing events or, or role-playing, I don't know, some other term that would best encapsulate getting together and telling a collective story um, because they're not really games anymore. Right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're not a winner and loser, and they're not tight enough. There's very few role playing games that are tight enough to really hold their own against like board game mechanics, right? Right. Mm. Um, and I think that's part of this idea, this adversarial idea is the reason that they held together was because of that adversarial relationship, right? Like we're going to pretend like this is a game, and we're going to lean on those rules in a way that I think we just don't lean on. Many people don't lean on those right. rules anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're just looking at a very different kind of experience yeah, than we were sure. used to. Awesome. Uh, let's see. We've got a couple of the things. Uh, do we need to know about the the tags, tracks, and ties? Yeah, I, I like the. I'd, I'd like to talk about them a little bit. They're um, definitely new to the game, and they are definitely uh, part of sort of more narrative game evolution. Mm-hmm. But it's recognizing it was an attempt to recognize that characters aren't just what they can do. Um, Characters are also the how they connect to the world and the challenges that they face uh, doing those things. So uh, tags are um, long-term or short-term alterations to the character's state. So um, maybe you are frightened. And this is not unique to Blue Planet. I mean, there's lots of games that use tags and qualities and those kind mm-hmm. of things. So I'm mm-hmm. ripping this directly out of the, the, the game universe. But um, maybe you... Um, you have, you know, that, that classic, like, oh, I got an old football injury. And so I'm minus two to run anything where I'm running. Mm. Right. Um, or uh, I just got the crap scared out of me. And now for the next, for the for remainder of this scene, I'm going to have a minus two to anything that requires me to be brave. Mm. Um, it, so they are, they can be, you know, as, as significant as just a scene, or they can be permanent alterations to the character. But they just give one more layer that we can differentiate the character from others and connect it to the events that have happened to the character mm. through their life. Um, and they can be as simple as, like I said, the bum me, or as complex as I have very complicated relationship with my polycule of, of um, family members, and um, I'm on the outs with them now, right? Mm. Um, it, it really is going to depend on how much players and game masters want to lean into that aspect of the game. Absolutely. Is, tracks, can, you, can you have the positives on that too? Is yep, there... You can have positives, you can have negatives. Like I am, I'm internet famous. 
And oh, okay. I can use that sometimes when I, when I, you know, when the situation merits like, oh, yeah. hey, did you see the, the video of that guy falling off the dock? That was me. <laughs> hey, chummy. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Very cool. Um, the, similarly, the, the tracks do just that. They kind of take, not directly the idea of the tags, but they take something that is important to your character's concept or more often when I run it, something that's important to the concept of the campaign mm -hmm. and they track it in real time through the course of play. So, um, for example, with the red sky charters game that I, that you played in, um, those characters have a track called red sky charters mm -hmm. and it is basically their relationship to red sky charters. They're all employees or close family friends that work at the company. And, you know, at the top of the track is, you know, a, I, uh, blood, sweat, and tears. I'll give my my life. I'll devote my life to this company. Mm -hmm. And the bottom of that track is screw it. I'm out. Right. Um, yeah. I'm done. And so, as events in the game happen, you can ask for relevant tests, uh, like maybe a psyche test or a logic test or a cognition test or, or or even a skill set test. And if it feels right, you can move that up or move that down, which will give you a nar a narrative role playing hook. In regards to, in this case, your relationship with the, the mm -hmm. company and how you feel about it. So if you're desperate for them to succeed uh, mechanically and you've moved up that track, you get some bonus. If this is the moment that's going to make or break the company's future, you get a little bonus. Right? Yeah. Or if your family is being held hostage like they were in the game you played yeah. and you're desperate to get them back, it could give you a penalty because you're so devoted to it. You're so wrapped up in it that it's making you nervous in this moment of negotiation with the gangsters. Right? Yeah. Um, so you get a, a penalty to that test. Um, or, you know, arguably in that same circumstance, it could be a bonus because you're so committed that you're willing to go all in. Right. So again, there's table negotiation around, is it a bonus? Is it a penalty? And that helps everyone understand what the is being loaded into that scene yeah but it gives you a hook because you can track it right there on your character sheet i i love all of these player hooks uh and player uh things that you can utilize to to role play your character from your character sheet uh instead of just trying to figure out well what would my character be thinking in this scenario like yeah. i've got this list of skills i've got these attributes but this actually like if you play to your character sheet, you'll be playing as your character. And I really like how that feels. Yeah, we're consciously trying to lean into some of the, the, the hooks right on the character sheet. I mean, really taking inspiration from things like Forged in the Dark. Right? Yeah. Where they put those things on the character sheet. But these are, we want them on the character sheet, but these are things that the characters get to create. One thing that I, I haven't had a lot of people lean into yet, but I'm hoping uh, players will, is that they can opt to make their own tracks as well. Um, maybe you want to play a character who, who is cowardly. Mm -hmm. So you would make like a bravery track and, um, you would, uh, okay. It's, it's different levels with the moderator and you play as you played, maybe you could, uh, um, evolve your character's bravery mm. as tracked on the character sheet. Um, and I, and I, I really think that will give a unique flavor to how people can opt to play their characters. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then ties are kind of self-explanatory. They're also not uncommon in a lot of games. I think games will call them like bonds or. or oh, yeah. 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 yeah right. Um, they, I think an important part. Of, I mean, how many characters did you play when you were younger that were orphans and didn't have a spouse or kids? Right. Um, and they hated everybody. And all they wanted to do was go get treasure. Right. Yeah. Um, and you're like, why are you playing in a group with other people? Right, like, just right, go. Right. Do a solo journaling game. And so the opposite sort of, of that, opposite is that is that you have an extended family that you are responsible for and you're constantly having to like do other stuff for that, right? And again, that might not be people's idea of escapism, but it is realistic to have ties to people and organizations. Mm -hmm. And that's the intent here. So the ties just identify as many or as few tie connections that your character has to specific people um, and then identifies what that connection is mm -hmm. and then that identifies what your obligation to that connection is. Nice. And, the, and then what happens if you don't meet that obligation. Is that uh, specifically NPCs or can you include player characters? Players in too. Well? In fact, uh, one of my favorite tricks now, um, the game, I'm, 
I wish I had plenty, uh, lots of time. I would love to talk to you guys about this game I'm currently <laughs> running. I'm a high school teacher. We're at a boarding school, um, and we've been bubbled up. So um, one I've of the seen things, some of your tweets about it right, too, and it's things, like fascinating. One of the things I've been able to do uh, is get kids into games a lot more because they're bored, right? And right. <laughs> before, when I'm like, "Come play a board game with me," they're like, "Oh, old man, leave me alone." Now they're like, "Okay, fine." And some of them. Um, we, we did a couple of one shots of Blue Planet, and they're like, "Can we play a campaign with our own characters?" And I'm like, "Yes, I got them." <laughs> um, so we've been playing every Friday night for weeks now, and their enthusiasm is what's keeping me going. So it's mm -hmm. pretty pretty cool. But um, one of the things I did was when we made the characters, I said, "Okay, now you need to make a tie with at least one NPC, and now you have to make a tie with someone else in the group." Mm -hmm. And they got so fired up. Like I sat back and for about half an hour, they were just like yelling at each other and enthusiastically, right? Like, no, no, you know him and you know, and, and I'm, and, and nope, nope. And they came up with this great web of interconnections that um, we can just lean on and play uh, that just makes the party, you know, it's the antithesis of you meet in a tavern, right? Yeah. You're mm -hmm. all complicated and mixed up with each other already. And here's how, and we haven't yep. even started playing the game yet. Um, so it's been, it's been, um, it's been playing out just as I hoped it would, at least at, at our table. That's awesome. Is there anything else we need to know before we dive into character creation? Um, probably not. I think a lot of it is explained along the way. Well, there's one thing I don't think that's in character creation that is relevant to character creation and that's character advancement. Um, okay. I, I tend to kind of forget about character advancement when I'm playing and I'm like, Oh guys, sorry. you." need some character improvement points that we've been ignoring for the past several weeks. Um, but I know a lot of people really like it and, and they like to advance their character and grow their character. So the way we're currently doing it with the new edition is through your character profile. Now the profile is part of character creation. We'll see that today, but um, character advancement is a, a separate mechanic. If you demonstrate your character profile through play, if you, uh, it's made up of your, attitude and your motivation and your goal. And if you demonstrate those things and pursue your goals, that's essentially how you earn the points that you spend on, on growing your character. Okay. Um, and so just keeping that in mind when you're, when we're making our profiles today, okay. might, might be helpful. Yeah. We could cover that more in depth during our advancement discussion segment, uh, in the last episode of the series. Uh, but that's good to keep in mind. Um, well, should we go ahead and make some people? I think we should. It looks like we're there. Oh, yeah. Let's make I'm some excited. people. Let's make some people. All right. Um, so I printed out my character sheet because uh, I recently fixed my printer uh, by actually buying toner for it. Ooh. I know. I'm, I'm, very, uh, I'm very excited for my, like, six-year-old, seven-year-old printer to actually work again. I was almost I, late today because I was trying to figure out how to make mine go black and white so I wouldn't use up all my cyan, but I ended up having to give up. So I have a very I pulled mine up on sheet. my iPad. I have my pencil, so I'm just going to write on here. And you're right in theme because you're not wasting paper. So yeah. you're being environmental. Good job. All right. So we'll see. I can't actually write very well because I can't hold a pencil, but it's okay. It's fine. <laughs> all right. Are we all set? I think so. I am so excited to dive into this. Um, so where do we start, Jeff? Well, um, technically, I mean, in, as it'll appear in the chapter, we start with character concept. Um, yeah. And, and the more I've thought about things, I'm considering adding in like a session zero recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, that's starting to also becoming um, pretty common. So I don't know that we need much detail about that in the actual book. Mm -hmm. But um, I think I always like to start there because I like cohesive parties and, and given blue planet is what we've said about being such a, a broad uh, possibility for, for characters, actions and, and play styles. Um, it seems like a good place to start. We don't have to do a full session zero here, but maybe figuring out what we would like our party to be doing would help inform what characters we wanted to make. Mm -hmm. absolutely um gosh there's so many good options for characters um in this game and so many good options for stories that we could tell i mm know -hmm. we could do native insurgency we could do um 
military peacekeeping. We could do corporate espionage. We could do uh, like urban urban crime. Um, we could do rural crime. Um, we could I do like corporate espionage. That sounds like fun to me. <laughs> I, I, I like corporate espionage too. Um, I, I I was intrigued by the uh, like urban or rural survival sort of okay. thing. Um, may, maybe a, a combination of the two. Interesting. Um, there are so, ways to do it for sure. I mean, there's a lot of secret corp uh, secret corporate uh, installations out in the yeah. bush that are being used for various purposes. Um, one that might be cool to consider. So there are a lot of isolated colonies, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and corporate facilities. Maybe we could combine the two by saying this one is particularly isolated and is, and it's not so much secret so that it actually is more subject to, um, espionage from other and corporate, which means that we could play the security team responsible for keeping keeping it secure mm -hmm. that would give us the rural, the urban the rural environment um, in which we'd have to also deal with the ecological threats uh, that are a big part of the blue planet setting um, yeah. as well as everything from the logistics of resupply and support um, to actual uh, spy assault or agent intrusion to the facility. Okay. You get a little of both, both of your flavors mixed in. So are we are we on the defensive corporate espionage or offensive corporate espionage? No reason you couldn't do both. That's true. They could, you could defend your place where where you're assigned, but then they could send you out on jobs occasionally to to back up or or to take advantage of your expertise. Okay. Is there is there such a thing as like uh, mom and pop corporate espionage? <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, he's um, like, I don't want to be part of a corporation. <laughs> sure. In fact, the that's the school group I was telling you about, we did a session zero and it's clear they so the one shots we did involved some uh, one in particular was very criminal activity. They were like full on doing a heist. And they liked that, but they also didn't want to just be criminals, so they're this security company that does security stuff, but sometimes a lot of it is would be considered illegal either in other places mm. or if if they were caught. So um, they basically wanted to be teenagers who could do whatever they wanted. They wanted to be lords of chaos. Only so, illegal. <laughs> so um, the, they are doing uh, just that. They are a little company that gets contracted out to anybody that wants a deniable asset. Um, so I wouldn't call them necessarily mom and pop. Right, right. They, they are a, a small group. Entrepreneurs, uh, basically, basically a cell, <laughs> a cell that works for a broker. <laughs> yeah, entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you want to be espionage entrepreneurs, Ryan? I think that sounds fun. Um, <gasps> Let's be a firm of private investigators. Ooh, I like that. So we can go and see if other big corporations are like doing stuff that they shouldn't be like advice, we get hired to find that out. as as advice to gms i find that those kinds of setups that you're just describing are perfect for a blue planet because there are so many things that people want to do sometimes it's not a matter of not being able to pick one it's a matter of like oh i want to do this one oh and this one oh and this one too with a setup like that <laughs> you can actually pull in all kinds of different parts yeah. of the setting um, because each job can be completely different Mm -hmm. um, and I find that with the Red Sky Charters, I can do that. And with this deep sea security that the kids are, are yeah. playing. Um, yeah. Let's can, let's be, uh, you know, a, a family owned, I guess, uh, private <laughs> investigation uh, firm. Okay. Okay. When we get to ties, we can figure out exactly how the family is structured. But I like <laughs> <Okay>. it. <laughs> I like it. I like it too. So under concept, is that? So we would... Yeah, so, that would be more like what I like. It would probably you know. end with PI, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> or or whatever your role is at the company. So maybe okay. you're not actually the PI, but you're the computer tech, or you're the like mm -hmm. the driver, or maybe you're a small a small mom and pop thing. You're probably several several things, right? So mm -hmm. wearing several different hats. Um, I want to be like the researcher. Oh, okay. 
That makes sense. The guy in the van, the person in the van. <laughs> it's always one of my favorite roles, especially in the world of the planet, because you have so much tech that will keep you actively involved um, with all the remote t- t- telepresence. Mm-hmm. So researcher, um, that kind of goes uh, with what I wanted to do is uh, I kind of want to be the like the smarty pants, but um, I don't know if you want to have two smarty pants in a group. Well, if you want to do that, that's fine. I can. No, I'm I'm good uh, with switching it up too. I suddenly uh, feel like we're doing leverage Blue Planet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I haven't watched. I had to rewatch that. I've not watched that in so long. Um, There's a reboot in the works. I know. I'm pretty excited. So, are you the mastermind? Is that what you're thinking, Ryan? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I, okay. I will be the mastermind uh, with aspirations of stardom. Ooh. Ooh. I'll be the hitter in leverage terms, or the grunt. I'll be the grunt. Okay. I was born with these brains, but all I want to do is sing. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant stardom as a mastermind. Like no. Start, stardom as like a performer. Wow. That, yes. That's even better. I, I love that. <laughs> it does make it hard for you to do clandestine work if you're also simultaneously trying to be famous. That's the, uh, yeah, it's the the life of the podcaster, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, well, true. It's a parallel there. <laughs> Is, so are you, I'm curious now, are you a singer or an actor or... I, I think a, my character a wants to digital sing. Digital artist, singer. Okay. Yeah, I think my character wants to sing. Nice. And so we will definitely have to have, at some point in the campaign, the musical episode. Oh, absolutely. Right. <laughs> so um, are we every day exceptional or elite? Oh, I mean, I think that's the next step on the list. I, yeah. I, f- I feel like every day, right? Like, yeah. At, at I mean, most exceptional. Yeah. But every day feels right for this sort of setup. Okay. I think we're everyday people with aspirations to be exceptional. No, you have aspirations to be exceptional. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. <laughs> so just for the sake of the listeners, there is a section in here that is undergoing constant rewriting, but um, is an evolution of something we used to do in the um, earlier edition, which is kind of like a 20 questions about your character to help spur the uh, concept on. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Just a list of questions that you can answer. There's not even a place to write them on the character sheet, but it's really just a, a creative tool. But things like what's your character's chronological age, and mm-hmm. what's the what was the biggest impact of where they grew up on their life, and you know what's your relationship with your parents, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I know there I, is uh, a few of those. Uh, you've got a parent age and actual age and pronouns and stuff like that on the second character sheet. Yeah, um, that's the profile, and there's actually a section dedicated to that. Mm-hmm. later on and then there's a whole notes section so technically technically it's there <laughs> it's true <laughs> the idea is that you don't have to feel like you have to have answers to all these questions but mm-hmm. it might spur you on when someone gets paper lock yeah absolutely i i do like that there's a lot of really good questions here um asking about your character's family um like how you were educated uh all that sort of stuff now, with everyday character power level, and I, I don't, I don't have a better term than power level. Uh, it, it just feels I don't like it because it sounds like a superhero game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, power level uh, is what it is at the moment. Um, w- with everyday, there's a couple of numbers that we can establish right off. Sure. So you you start with zero bonuses to your attribute ranks, so you can go ahead and write in your first numbers. So cognition, psyche, coordination, and physique would all start at zero, which is considered unmodified human average. Okay. Um, Now, you are allowed to bump those up and down a little bit, but they all still have to average to zero. So, um, and we can talk about that. uh, Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, You also get um, five skill sets. So you're going, if you look at the character sheet, you'll notice how... Uh, in very faint writing behind each skill set is sort of an identifier to tell you what that skill set is related to. Um, okay. And and the first five uh, are in a in blue, and those represent everyday characters. So you'll fill in, you know, you'll get five to to fill in in, in those five lines. 
Um, and as we get to the next section, I can explain what origin, background, occupation, and so forth means. Awesome. But you're going to get you're going to get five skill sets, um, areas of expertise, and you can um, um, assume that your character will have something around twenty five corporate script worth of bio modifications. So in this setting, especially on Poseidon itself, very few people are completely unmodified. Um, but at the everyday level, you've got about 25,000 script worth. Awesome. And we probably won't get into that in as much detail as we might otherwise um, in, in today today's game, simply because we're still um, finalizing the conversion of a lot of the tech to the new mechanics. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can give you some some of the tech that your characters might want based on the things that you decide your character's concept would have. Mm, very cool. All right. Um, I, I find myself sort of guiding you guys through this. Is that what you were intending or would you yeah, like to be and, guided and through this? You, you'll want to create a character yourself, I'm assuming. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm the grunt. Yep. Um, and I right now um, am considering the next question, Excellent. which is species. Yes. Um, the again, from a biological standpoint, because I, that's my training, um, I describe character species as as a little more loosely than what actual species are. I mean, mm-hmm. most of these species can interbreed. So, from a biological standpoint, they're not actually species. But I much prefer that terminology over race mm-hmm. because it's not that anyway. And these characteristics were intentionally built into these different species through genetic modification, which is also a very different thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but some of them can't interbreed, which does kind of fit the species um, species designation. So your character, uh, you need to pick one, uh, and there are a variety. Uh, you can be uh, a completely unmodified human. Um, you can be a modified human, which um, many people are, and there are sort of two types of those. There are those that have been modified postnatally, so after they were born, Mm -hmm. Um, or those that were modified prenatally, um, which are essentially genetic redesigns, or at least tweaks of the normal genome. And there are a variety of of those. Uh, If you are playing a native, or if you decided you wanted the general modification, you can be an aquaform, which is a, a species unto itself, but it is what the natives of the planet, the original colonists, were all modified before they came, to be essentially amphibious. They have either the capacity to hold their breath for a long time, or they have gill, actual gills. They have nictating membranes, collapsing lungs, webbed fingers, that kind of thing. So they mm. spend a lot of time, I mean, on a planet that is 97% ocean, um, and you're sent them there to survive. It was essentially um, a no-brainer. Um, so that is an example of one of the redesigns. Uh, there are several others um, to choose from. Cognitive synergists are extremely rare. It's funny, most of these are pretty rare. Um, um, but because we're player characters, um, they tend so to be... People always pick. Right, right. <laughs> yep. um, and we've actually tried to lean into why there might be disproportionate numbers of them on Poseidon uh, in the backstory. But cognitive synergists, there's probably a hundred or, or maybe a thousand in all of creation because it's an experimental design that comes with a lot of um, problematic elements. Uh, but it was an attempt to increase the mental capacity of humans. Uh, and you can see in, in the character uh, creation text that you have the benefits that you get. There's a bonus to cognition, um, but it makes it does have a negative effect on your psyche um, and your physical coordination. Um, and you can choose whether you are undergoing uh, therapy to help moderate your emotions or whether you're foregoing that therapy and it has different effects on mm. how the, the cognitive synergist is realized. This is a, a interesting character. This kind of thing happens a lot in Blue Planet. You're not, this is not a game in which you try to power game. Right? I mean, you can, if you want to, that's fine. But if you also want to tell meaningful stories about people's struggles with who they are and what they're trying to accomplish, there's lots of ways to give your character ways to identify with those struggles. Mm. And, and cognitive synergist is intended as that, right? Like, sure, I want to play the brainiac in uh, the scenario, but I'm also really interested in um, challenging myself to deal with my interpersonal relationships or my willpower or things that are about my character that um, make for an interesting protagonist. 
Mm. Uh, you can make the kinds of what I like best about making characters in Blue Planet is you can make the kinds of characters that would appear in a novel, uh, and a, not a novel about an action hero, but a novel about someone who is trying to deal with big challenges and overcome them. Mm -hmm. um, they're not intended to be superheroes, um, unless you make an elite character and then you're playing a different game, but that's fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's a whole bunch of different hybrids, which uh, is a general term for different human species that were mixed with some uh, select genetics from other terrestrial species. So there are feline hybrids and silva hybrids. Uh, felines are obviously uh, cat DNA, big cat DNA. Uh, and silva hy silvas are um, hybrids with uh, gorilla G DNA, a silver mm -hmm. gorilla DNA. The idea was that, the again, these are very rare, but because they... They have that cool factor for sci-fi gamers. They are pretty common in the PC realm. Yeah. Um, but they were an attempt to make super soldiers by a corporation. It was illegal. They got busted. The these um, the experiments, the, the people who, who this would, was done to, the, the children were freed. Um, and uh, one because they had been raised as super soldiers, um, the GEO gave them the opportunity to join the military if they wanted. Um, many of them did. They also funded a colonial effort on Poseidon for them. So look, a free ride to Poseidon, you can become part of the colonial effort and have your own your own society, your own land. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll repatriate you there if you, if you want to go. So a lot of them took advantage of that. And so there are a disproportionate number on Poseidon because you know, they're, um, they had the opportunity to, to go to this new and, mm. and healthy world and be part of the colony effort. Yeah. Um, so those are options. Uh, composites are an amalgamation of lots of different animal DNA uh, put into the, to the human genome. So they are just durable and quick and wiry and tough, but they tend to be uh, pretty uh, wild-spirited, um, emotional, uh, aggressive, um, and they are not. They, they are. They don't play well with others. Um, and so that's an interesting character to bring into a, a group. Uh, spacers are genetically engineered for low or zero G environments. They've got prehensile, basically hands instead of feet, uh, and uh, light bones and and um, a lot of modifications that are made for life in zero G. They can walk in a gravity well, live in a gravity well, but it's hard on them. Um, and so they would be mostly for games that you'd want to play in the asteroid belt or in orbit. Um, Survivor mods are just mostly a normal human, but they've been redesigned to just be a little more durable for rough environments. Heat tolerance, temperature tolerances are higher. They can eat um, just about anything that's organic without getting sick. Um, some mods like that. Mm -hmm. By far the most common um, human uh, hybrid or uh, genetic redesign are the transhumans. So you get a, a couple of bumps to your attributes, um, a couple of bumps to some other uh, things. And it's just, it's the kind of thing we're approaching now, right? Where you can uh, select certain traits for your offspring. Mm -hmm. um, so in general, there is a biological class that is quickly separating from the other biological classes based on access to resources, right? Okay. So if you're wealthy, your kids are going to be better looking and they're going to be smarter and they're going to be healthier. And, um, and so that's what the transhumans are. And of course, these things are all traits that you can actually, if you choose to, make them a character creation, but you could become the equivalent of transhuman if you had enough money in the game. You could buy the therapies that would turn you into that and theoretically mm. into any of these. You could become an aquaform if you chose to. It's just kind of expensive. Okay. Of course, you could also play a cetacean. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is a whole nother thing that some people think is awesome about Blue Planet and other people think is weird uh, and and just don't want to touch. Um, but uh, as part of the backstory, cetaceans were uplifted, uh, dolphins initially, um, and then orcas, common dolphin, uh, sorry, uh, bottlenose dolphins initially, and then orcas. And they uh, a, a small population was part of the original colony effort. So there are native cetaceans as well as humans. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in the intervening uh, hundred years, there have been all the other cetacean races that were still alive, cetacean species that were still extant, 
had been uplifted. And many newcomers are cetaceans as well, because, hey, polluted earth, oceans dying. Wow, a whole ocean planet that already has like cetaceans who are uh, equals in society. Well, sign me up. Um, and I think what people are intimidated by is this idea of, well, I'm in the water all the time. How do I play with everyone else when there's land stuff going on? Well, telepresence is ubiquitous um, in the game, and every cetacean has at least one, if not many, remotes that keep them not only engaged with the other characters wherever they are, but give them full capacity to manipulate the environment um, and, and experience that environment as mm. if they were there. Uh, in fact, uh, there's an advantage because in reality, cetaceans uh, sleep with only half of their brain at a time mm -hmm. uh, because they need to be able to breathe. So they keep swimming and coming to the surface with half of their brain while the other half sleeps and then, and then switch. Um, we decided that in the fiction, that means that when they're awake, they can do telepresence. They can kind of do two things at once, mul genuinely multitask, whereas the humans actually can't. Um, they can actually multitask two things at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they can have telepresence in one place while they're also doing something else in another which gives them an advantage um, as a character. So you can play, you can now play bottlenose dolphins, common dolphins, orcas, um, and, uh, and pilot whales. Mm -hmm. They have all, they all have, oh, and beluga whales. That was the other one. They all have representative populations on the planet. And they've got a whole, we've got a whole source book dedicated to them in the second edition. So their, their world and their, their possibilities are fully fleshed out. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, so many good options. I, I don't, I'd love your guys' opinion on something. So yeah. one of the things that we're, that I put into the, the Kickstarter as a stretch goal is to introduce a new, uh, a, a new set of uh, character species. Mm -hmm. And one of them, sometimes I think is ridiculous and stupid. Other times I think, oh my God, this is so cool. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm trying to get people's opinions. Um, the, there is an idea that there was a kind of ego maniacal uh, and corporate oligarch who had all the resources and he they're extinct on earth but he was able to clone and artificially uh, gestate a sperm whale mm. and he has released 12 sperm whales on poseidon um and they are therefore available as player characters oh um that, that that's the idea that i'm toying with and what makes it a little bit ridiculous is they're so big, right? Mm -hmm. um, but ma that's also what makes it so cool uh, in my mind. Yeah. Um, but it also may make it feel over the top, even for a world where genetic engineering has, has allowed for immortality. But um, I don't know. Yeah. I feel like that's like players' choices, though. Like if they want to play with that, then go for it. You know, like <laughs> some people want it to be over the top. I, I don't. Are you guys familiar with... Uh, Eclipse phase, the game? Vaguely. Hmm. They have uh, whales that, are, that live in the corona of the sun, which I think is fantastic. Um, <laughs> they're genetically engineered creations, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's fantastic. Uh, but I think a lot of people, even in the over-the-top world of Eclipse phase, are like, nope, that's just dumb. And so it's made me a little sensitive <laughs> to this idea. But. No, it makes a lot more sense on a fully aquatic world uh, to bring in like extinct species or or what have you uh and and especially elevate them to uh the same level as these other cetaceans uh that that makes perfect sense in my brain well like, i bring that up not because it's an option for you today because we haven't yeah. really figured out how that would work but it was something i wanted to pick your brains about i mean full blue whales would be nice <laughs> <laughs> There's some cool. evidence that um, the baleen whales have lost a lot of some of their cognitive uh, adv advantages mm. um, just because they're not predators. And oh, interesting. It, it makes it, a, you know, there's a lot that your brain has to do to be a predator mm -hmm. uh, that your brain doesn't have to do when you just open your mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, in a world where you can modify things, there's no reason why they couldn't yeah. have modified the brain. Oh, that's really interesting. What are you thinking, Ryan? Um, goodness, I was I was kind of going between um one of the human, uh, the regular human types, 
um, or uh, cognitive synergist. That's what which, I want to do. Um, which I, I figured you probably wanted to go that route. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe transhuman as well. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll I'll go transhuman for this one. I know I went feline last time. You did. Um, but I think I want to go transhuman this time because uh, for whatever reason. Okay, so, why not? So I wanna, with transhuman, I you'll get you'll get a plus one to any two different attributes. Mm-hmm. So right now we're at zeros. Right? Yeah. So uh, any one of any two of those are now twos. Okay. You just can't make a you can't make one of them um, a four, right? Oh, sorry, okay. let me back up. Any any two of those are ones. You yes. can't make any one of them a two. That makes sense. Um. So since we have a concept of mastermind. I'm going to put my cognition to one. And if you want to be a star and have a mm-hmm. little charisma, then they might put the second one in psyche. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. Because that's our catch-all for things like willpower and charisma and those kind of elements. Nice. Is there a spot for writing your species? Um, it is in the second page under features. Or it should be. Is that something we left off of here what uh, i think we need to add it in it yeah. looks like it got left off we're in the drafting stages for this character sheet so we need to make sure it gets in here so it would be under features okay and then uh ryan you would also get a plus two to any kind of social maneuver where grace uh and appearance could be influential you okay. have a physicality as a transhuman unless you have specifically chosen to have a particular uh, uncanny look Mm-hmm. Um, if you've gone with sort of the norms of human appearance, then you're just going to be better looking and there's going to have the advantages that come with that. Yeah. Um, so you get, gain a plus two in any tests that are, or any social maneuvers that involve appearance or, or grace. I like that. And then you want to be a cognitive synergist. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so it looks like cognition plus three, yep. psyche minus two and coordination minus one. Correct. Um, and that just depends on whether you want to be really diligent about um, your emotional regulation therapies. Um, or, uh, well, I, as a person, am very diligent about okay. my emotional regulation therapy. So, and, the, and in and in game, if there were some reason to, that you got separated from that, right, we're mm-hmm. unable to then then we could shift. But there, that would change those modifiers a little bit. Cool. I, I got to admit to. Um, and maybe I'm, I'm assuming you guys do this all the time, so you probably have much stronger opinions than I do. But I worry about the intent of these kinds of things coming through the in an honest way, whereas there's a lot of sort of bioessentialism discussions that are going on around character creation these days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, like, why are orcs always evil? Seems to be like sort of the center right. of those conversations. Um, and I can see that in as we even as I make characters with you guys today, I feel like is it is it fair to give a penalty to psyche to a character because of uh, the idea of game balance? Because we're we've abandoned game balance. There's nothing in Blue Planet mm-hmm. that addresses game balance really, mm-hmm. except that everyday characters kind of start with the same resources to build an everyday character. Um, yeah, I mean, like I obviously can't speak for everybody, but like one of the things that a- appeals to me about that is that like i have borderline personality disorder so emotional regulation extremely difficult for me and it is a thing that i see a therapist for every two weeks and i am very diligent about like so for me it's like oh that's hey <laughs> that's me <laughs> um oh, that's good that's great so to hear. you know like i can't obviously like some people might be like mm, that's a little weird but like mm-hmm. for me like yeah, that makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the <laughs> like, hope is that we provide opportunity, not enforce stereotypes. But it's hard right. when you're when you're trying to make a game and, and let people do the process we're doing today with some sort of like step by step number crunching. Mm-hmm. Right. But I, but I get sensitive about it, and I and I I worry that we're doing it um, with grace. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think. There's something to be said for it. like none of this is like you are inherently good or you are inherently bad, which I think makes a difference. There's nothing in here that's like you are for sure always 100% better because you did mm. this thing. 
And in the cases where that might be true, it's like that's part of the thing that we're unpacking in this game mm. is like, you know, like if you have a corporation that's like, we're genetically modifying these people to make them better. But like that corporate structure is something that this game is unpacking too. Well, I appreciate so, that perspective. That's I like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so we've got our species. Uh, now we would do um, what profile. Are you going, what are you going with, Jeff? Oh, um, I am going to go with Survivor, I think. Ooh. Uh, well, uh, I guess the question would be related to ties. We can figure that out. Um, I'm going to go. I think I'm going to go with Survivor, just because it's simple. I was going to. I was leaning towards the um, composite because I always like to play sort of like a, I have a soft spot for nihilistic characters. <laughs> uh, and because they don't play well with others i thought that would be a fun like i work in a small family business and i don't play well with others which would imply that you guys are the only ones that tolerate me kind of thing yeah mm -hmm. um but uh i i don't have the composite list pulled up in front of me so just to make it simple <laughs> that's <laughs> fine what a doozy of an episode. It might be one of our longest single episodes yet, uh, which is just wild. Jeff was such a delight to have on the show, and I am really hyped for this game. Uh, if you are just as hyped for this game, uh, there is a Kickstarter that is starting this week for this very game. Uh, just head to the show notes and see what amazing stuff is in store for you. And stay tuned for next week when we finish creating our characters and show off some of the really cool features of this game. Also, don't forget about Pond Chaser's Reviews for Good campaign that they brought back from last year. This is going to help a lot of people, but only if you leave reviews. You can head on over to our Pond Chaser page and leave a review if you haven't already, but you can also leave reviews for specific episodes if you wish. For every review left this way, Pond Chaser is going to donate 25 cents to Meals on Wheels, and that's pretty remarkable. It'd be really cool if we could get some more reviews as well, because then we'd have more to read in this spot. But if you're going to leave a review, this is the way to do it this month. And while you're there, check out some of your other favorite podcasts and leave them some reviews, too. That's all we have for today. Thanks for joining us for this extra-sized episode. We hope you'll join us next time for some more fantastic character creation. Until then, take care, everyone. Stay safe and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time.
we got to read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like One Shot. The most fun way to learn about new games is to play. On One Shot, you can discover the amazing variety in RPGs by listening to actual play. Every week, James D'Amato brings you a new episode with a talented cast of improvisers, game designers, and other notable nerds. At least once a month, One Shot features a new system exploring a wide variety of genres. The stories are self-contained, so you can jump in anywhere, and it's a great way to find your new favorite game. Discover the magic of RPGs with One Shot and your favorite podcast app.